All right, well, hello, I'm Ted Rappaport from NYU Poly and NYU, and thank you, Henning and Julie, for the opportunity to be part of the panel. I thought that uh, it might be interesting to have a bird's eye view, a first-hand look at what happened in Manhattan uh, before, during, and after Sandy. As engineers, whether we're power engineers or communications engineers, we're always trying to engineer for reliability. It's our job uh, to serve the public. Professional engineers take an oath, in fact, to do that. And we, we uh, face varying degrees of certainty or uncertainty in trying to carry out this mission as en engineers. Whether it's the World Series earthquake of 1989, which Bob mentioned, where you have no idea that it's going to come, or if it's the uh, third quarter of the Super Bowl this past weekend when power goes out for 34 minutes, and you have some idea that it could happen. In fact, reports in September through November at the Superdome were worried about a power outage because of the decaying connection from the dome back to the power grid. Or if it's something like Sandy, where we have full knowledge that something bad is going to happen, but we don't know exactly what the details will be. In fact, Friday before the Monday evening when Sandy hit uh, the New York, New Jersey area, everyone had a very good idea, or at least should have, that something bad was going to happen. This was posted about uh, 28 hours before uh, power went out in Manhattan. Uh, where 10 million users, uh, customers were predicted to have power outages. So in this case, the engineers in the power engineering community knew something terrible was going to happen, but you just don't know what's going to happen. So I'll give you a first-hand account of what happened in Manhattan uh, as a communications engineer. And actually, uh, I was fortunate because I have another colleague who's in the room with me, also a communications engineer, David Goodman, who is a refugee at our apartment in uh, downtown. So, so this is kind of our collective thoughts and observations of what happened, both the human behavior and also the technical issues of when something like this hits. So this is a photograph of Manhattan uh, about an hour after the power outage. It was 8.20 p.m. on a Monday night. Uh, my wife had cooked David and I a wonderful dinner and we saw the lights flicker, kind of like on those movies of the Titanic where you see the lights go off and come on and then go off again. And after about the fifth flicker, power was totally out. And uh, we live on 14th Street and uh, uh, 6th Avenue, which is somewhere kind of in here. And the, the big power station that went out is over on the right side at 14th Street and 1st Avenue, where water became so great, the flood waves became so great, it basically flooded out and created a huge substation power outage. Now what's interesting about this figure, if you look on the bottom left, you can see all those lights that are lit up. And that's Battery Park, where David uh, lives. And he, he and everyone in that part of Manhattan were instructed to leave. Because the waves, which up until then had been 14 feet, the largest record recording, were predicted to be greater. And in fact, they hit 17 feet as the water came down the Hudson. But remarkably, during the tragedy, and it was a tragedy, they did not lose power in the part of Manhattan that was most feared to be hit and damaged. Yet, most of downtown Manhattan did lose power. This goes to show that even if you know something bad's gonna happen, the engineers really have a difficulty dealing with it. Now, one thing you should look at, at this picture is realize that it doesn't matter what kind of diversity, connectivity you have. If there's no power, things won't work. Uh, I was amazed after 8.30 p.m. when the power went out, how long I could use my cell phone. I was able to use it through midnight. I was able to SMS everyone, all our family, as was David. We have different carriers. So the, the cellular infrastructure, to me, worked remarkably well. And during this time when you had cranes dangling. In fact, in our neighborhood, there was a crane that was hanging over a church and fire departments came and I've never seen anything like it. And, and all the stoplights were out and you had police on every corner. It was really like a Mad Max film. I was able to do SMS messaging. The, uh, the
the one thing that you have to realize, though, is the infrastructure needed to provide wireless capacity in a place like Manhattan requires cell sites every few hundred meters. And more and more, with the need for data, the carriers are relying on cable connectivity or other providers that are providing this very high band with QoS, 50, 100, 200 megabits per second will be needed as LTE is rolled out. So you basically have this infrastructure. The backhaul is the big issue. So even if you have battery power, if you lose power along the way in the backhaul, which is increasingly going to be short connectivity, you're not going to have wireless coverage if there's no power. Despite the great uh, wind, you know, 50, 70, 80 mile an hour winds, the uh, anecdotal accounts I've heard is that the cellular infrastructure, the antennas, the cabling, really held up remarkably well. So the big issue is power. Uh, after the, uh, and by the way, this happened at 8.20 p.m. We lost this power. Uh, David and I decided to uh, go out and look around Manhattan, because this really was unprecedented, to see police at every corner and cranes flying around. Uh, we walked next door, uh, a block away, and this, I, apparently all our families had seen this around the country. The face of a building blew off. Do you remember that on 7th Avenue? The Weather Channel kept showing this. We didn't see it because our TV wasn't on, but people told us about it. We walked a block away and saw the face of this building had fallen off, and debris came flying at us at a, you know, 50 miles an hour. We ducked around the corner and ran away and decided to go back into the apartment, which is what you're supposed to do. But it was really a, a harrowing sight, and yet I was able to do SMS messaging. Uh, the next day, we got up and decided to find coffee, and we found that all of Manhattan was doing the same thing. This was the zombie coffee walk. And all of us were walking north because at 28th Street, there was power, and perhaps more importantly, there was internet. So we went into coffee shops and saw lines of people sharing outlets, AC outlets with their phone chargers. People were very gracious and nice, and people would plug in for five minutes and let other people come in. And that was the discussion. It was really remarkable, and it showed the importance of internet and messaging over voice. So Wednesday, uh, we decided to walk along the uh, Hudson back to Battery Park, and uh, we found that uh, we saw where the water had gone up to 17 feet, and it was really, really terrible. One of my students, in fact, told me she lives in Staten Island. A boat landed up in her backyard came two feet from her house. And I still have students at NYU that are displaced, and probably some in this room are still affected by, by the, uh, the uh, damage and maybe have been displaced. But the fact that people sought out internet right after the issue, and uh, that was really valued, uh, showed you that uh, there was still connectivity despite what had happened, as long as you got to 28th Street and above. So I'll wrap up with just some observations. That's worth keeping in mind, I think, as engineers as we try to solve uh, and prevent these issues. The first issue is that weather predictions are remarkably good. We knew days in advance that this was going to hit, and often we do. It's much more difficult to defend against, say, an earthquake or something unexpected. By the way, Beyonce anticipates this kinds of thing. She had her own generator powering the entire show. Did you know that? So performers have diversity built in. But weather predictions are remarkably good. Secondly, the human behavior going on that zombie coffee walk shows that the human condition requires communications more than ever before, which is something Bob said. We crave and need communications more than ever before. And I might just put in a plug, because I also am a ham radio operator, yes. that probably the best investment the FCC does in this country for the cost is providing the amateur radio spectrum because in 1989, ham radio operators were inventing Wi-Fi and the wireless internet. So the spectrum bands for ham operators, which are so small, provide a huge dividend. And still today, they still may want voice bob in emergency conditions. Uh, thirdly, the communications infrastructure, I believe, held up amazingly well. You know, we're not in the world of five nines when the AT&T Bell Monopoly ran the phone calls. We're in the internet age where we expect outages and emails don't always go. But the fact is the cellular and wireless infrastructure, the ability to SMS I thought was remarkable. 
And SMS really was the mode. It was very reliable as, lo as long as there was power. Also, maybe a key takeaway is we really need rapidly deployable power and backhaul. Bob is talking about light iron or little iron uh, cells, cell on wheels. And it's really backhaul. So you could do millimeter wave backhaul. You could roll out the millimeter wave line of sight links and provide these few hundred meter backhauls with Spectrum today. And then finally, uh, I think rapidly deployable cell on wheels really need to include Wi-Fi. They already include SMS. But the ability to get Wi-Fi was shown in those coffee shops. Thank you.